For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me, and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart, and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress, and take away all my sins. See how numerous are my enemies, and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life, and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you. Deliver Israel, O God, from all their troubles. Christmas Carol event on December 20th at 6.30 p.m. 
And of course, the Sunday after the following, that will be our Christmas Eve. So we have our morning service and our Christmas Eve service in that evening as well. So lots going on here at Highfield for Christmas time. We're really, really excited about that. We hope you can make it up to some of these events, uh, or all of them, which would be fantastic, and uh, join us there. Finally, we want to extend uh, this morning our, our heartfelt sympathies to to Veda on the passing of her mother, Jean. Uh, Veda's with us today, and uh, her mother passed away on November 27th. We're, we're uh, happy to have her here today and to worship you with us, but our heartfelt condolences go to you and, and, and to all of you who are, who are uh, mourning at this time. So please uh, please keep her in your prayers. Please keep the family in your prayers too. Thank you. I want to draw your attention to our blue card. This is in your bulletin. If you've seen this before and you're our first time, if you've seen this before, you know what it is, but this is your first time here. This is our chance to connect with you. You can fill it out, fill out all the information, and you want to what we'll get you to do is to tear it uh, in two after you've done that and deposit the card you filled out into one of our blue card boxes at any of our entrances and exits on the way out today. This is our chance to get a hold of you, to get in touch with you, and so if you have a prayer request or something like that, please take a moment to fill that out in our service today. Thank you in advance for doing that. Let's open our service properly now with, with prayer. Let's come to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be in your presence this morning, to be in your house worshiping together. <coughs> Lord, as we begin the Advent season, as we begin to celebrate what this time of year means for us as Christians, Lord, as your servants, Lord, we pray that the hope of this season surround us, that we be filled with your presence, that we be filled with your mission that you have for each of us. Lord, as you call us to, to love you, to serve you in the many ways we are called, Father, we pray that hope that we have, that we cling to, exudes from us so that other people can see just how great it is and they will want it as well. Lord, may we be hopeful and may we worship you this morning. May we praise your name and lift it high. In Jesus' holy, perfect name. Well, good morning, church. How many of you love, love, love the Christmas season and are super excited to be seeing all the decorations and getting your shopping done? Let me see anything else. I see some excitement in the room. Half, yeah? I'm excited. I love the Christmas season. It's nice just to walk around and see the lights. And, and uh, I hope it's a time of reflection and worship for you, too. A real time to sort of turn your hearts toward the birth of Christ in a new, fresh way. The incarnation. God becoming man. It's an amazing concept. I'm, I'm really excited that Martine Kelsey is with us today, though I've been sort of <laughs> threw her into the to the rat race of crazy uh, morning practice, which um, is not always uh, throwing songs together. is uh, sometimes tough on a Sunday morning, yet she so, so gracefully has joined us. And Martine is a recording artist, and she's led worship here before, earlier in October, if you remember. But I heard she was going to be here, and so, come on up, Martine, you have to find us. Would you give her a warm welcome, a high field welcome this morning?
we'll touch it over there. All right. At this time, uh, we're, we're going to be bringing the children forward in just a moment. Uh, as it is the Advent season, we want to recognize uh, this as being just that, and we're going to recognize the hope candle this morning. I'd like to call upon the Haynes and the Shans to come forward at this time as we recognize the beginning of our Advent season. Today, we light the candle of expectation and hope. May it remind each and every one of us of God's great promise to us. He is our hope, He is our Redeemer, and He is our Savior. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, uh, during the Advent season, may we be reminded of your promises to us and to your fulfillment of them. Help us to prepare our lives for his advent within us. In his precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs> this way. Hi. Hi. I'm over right here. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> Lots of you up here today. A little crowded. We're making it Sunday. We're, we're, we're making it work. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. We're going to pray for you. It is a, there's a lot to... Are you guys excited for Christmas? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. You're hopeful for Christmas. It's coming. You probably have things you may be hoping for and things like that. No? You know, we have a video we're going to show. We have a video we want to show you right now, and it's a video about the things that people might be hoping for for Christmas. And so at this time, I'm going to ask them to show the video here, so take a look to the screen, guys. We're going to show you a little video. Daughter, parents, and my brother, who I haven't seen 
to very to you know, very often. This Christmas season, I'm really hoping to spend some quality time with family and also just to enjoy perhaps a little bit of snow. <laughs>
the Lord. May this be a year that we worship like never before, quieting ourselves before you, thanking you for the incredible gift of your Son to redeem us. Thank you, God, for who you are. We praise your name this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
words, Jesus is the hope of the world. <coughs> the fate of mankind. Have you thought about it much? Just in a quick search, I recognize that there were listed 127 wars that mankind has fought in which the death toll has, has been over 100,000 people. In fact, the 12 top wars list over 10 million killed during that war, and some much more than that. When we think about our world today and we understand about the whole idea of our earth, we're concerned about a few things. One of them is fresh water. In fact, in 2020, about 30 to 40 percent of the world will have water scarcity. According to researchers, and the climate change will even make it worse, says Science Daily. In Business Week, it says, with only 7% of the world's fresh water, China plans to produce 807 million gallons a day from desalination by 2020. According to the U.S. intelligence community, an assessment of global water security by 2030 Humanity's annual global water requirements will exceed the current stable water supplies by 40%. Current population that is undernourished. A movement called A Life You Can Save claims that there are currently 800 million people in the world who go hungry every day. The estimated population growth by 2070 is 9.4 billion people in the world, which means that if our current percentages stay the same, 1 billion, 28 million, and 700,000 people will be very hungry in 2070. If all levels stay the same, which is a big if, because it means that our current production level for agriculture has to stay with the population growth. That would be the number. Otherwise, it would be far greater. You say, why'd you pick 2070? Because I'll be 102. <laughs> the plight of humanity. The bubonic plague, the black plague, killed 30 to 60% of Europe's total population. In the last decade of the 18th century, 7% of Europeans died from smallpox. The worldwide cancer states or stats from 2012 from the UK was that there was 14.1 million new cases of cancer per year and 8.2 million of those people died. In first world countries like ours, our statistics for cancer survival is much better because we have better access to health care and more funds to fund it. Where is the hope? Where is the hope? Is our hope in technology? Do we understand that we're able to do so many more things that we never thought possible? 50 to 100 years ago, the things we do today were magic back then. They were un unheard of. Beyond the sphere of the ability, Carissa mentioned to us earlier this year that when she was in Papua New Guinea in a tribal third world area, that they used to cook their food in uh, banana leaf made baskets that are put into the ground. And one lady got a pot. And all the older ladies in the tribe said, this new technology is going to ruin us. <laughs> technology, is it the hope for mankind? In TED Talks, which you may be familiar with, are brief clips of informational, uh, educational clips that you can find online. It tells us that technological advances are based upon one major component, and that is the amount of energy we have to be able to make things. We are so very quickly using up the world's energy resources. We know that the sun has a great potential for energy, but we're far from being able to harness 
what we need to from the sun to make energy. Technological advances bring limited hope. What about the hope of humanity? Isn't humanity as itself able to fix its problems? Erasmus said, education, the main hope of a nation lies in the proper education of its youth. An unknown, an un, unknown author says, stop doubting yourself, work hard and make it happen. The Conversation, which is a journal, says, education has been long recognized as a route out of poverty for individuals and has a way of promoting equality of opportunity. Education can do a lot, but what can education not do? This tells us that even the teacher sometimes can't figure out the problem. What education cannot do is prevent jealousy. What education cannot do is stop envy or greed. What can education do? It can't answer the big questions of life. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Where am I going? Maybe our hope is not in technological advances. Maybe our hope isn't in humanity, although sometimes I think we put it there. And maybe our hope is in our imagination. For truly, mankind has always had a great imagination. One time, we imagined that we could talk to somebody across the world in living time. And we created the telephone. And now we talk to each other around the world in visual images that are alive. Imagination, we dreamed about putting a man on a moon. And then we did it. We dreamed about speaking to people all around the world. And today we can in a moment of time. But we also dreamed about world peace. Haven't quite done so well in that one. We are limited by fantasy. We can only dream so much by fantasy, but the reality of what is in our hearts changes us. Listen to what Albert Einstein said. The real problem is in the heart and minds of men. It is not a problem of physics, but of ethics. It is easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil spirit of mankind. It is becoming more and more obvious, said Carl Jung, that it is not starvation, not microbes, and not cancer, but man himself, who is mankind's greatest danger. The hope of the world. It doesn't rely on humanity. It doesn't rely on fantasy. It doesn't rely on our technological ability. Where can we understand the hope of the world? Nor Norman O. Brown in Life Against Death said this, Today, even the survival of humanity is a utopian hope. His own sense is that there is no hope for the world, really. Listen. The problem of lack of hope and meaning to life is not unique to our generation. It has been expressed by others in the past who have felt the same emptiness as our modern world feels. To a, to a large segment of the population, this life is all there is, and there's no hope beyond the grave, but that idea is nothing new. You wonder why our generation today is living for the moment? They can't see beyond this hope. But listen, against this backdrop of pessimism, Jesus Christ offers real hope. He gives mankind the opportunity to become right with God and his fellow man. Thus, Christianity offers a, to a full life to those who accept Jesus Christ. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus is the hope as the Savior of the heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9 through 11, it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not deceive your, uh, sorry, do not be deceived. 
Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Listen, one of the greatest hopes for mankind is that Christ can change the heart of a man. Amen. Wow. Isn't that great? Yeah. Boy, is that he is changing my heart every day. My old nature still rags its ugly head. Jesus transforms my heart. I'd like to sit and talk about it for a while. Pass the mic around the room. And ask you how Jesus has transformed your heart. What is the hope of the world? It certainly can't be simply in our technological advances. It can't be in the idea that humanity is good and somehow it's going to rectify itself. It can't be in some kind of fantasy that we're going to make the dreams actually happen. It has to be in the one who transforms the heart of mankind, Christ himself. Jesus is the hope. Because he is the Savior of the heart. Jesus is the hope and Savior of the body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corrupt inherit incorruption. Behold, I will tell you now about a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption is put on incorruption, and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to the saying that is said, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? <laughs> I love it. <sighs> therefore, my beloved brother, therefore, because we have an incorruptible body that will be renewed in heaven one day, therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast in a world that's going to decay. Be immovable in a world that's resources and hope seem blim. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because the work of the Lord is a labor that is not in vain. Jesus is the hope of a Savior for our heart. Jesus is the hope of a Savior for our bodies. And some of you might be saying like me, as I get older, my body's getting weaker. I still like to think I can play ball with the 20-year-olds. <laughs> Five minutes on the court tells me otherwise. But one day, my body is going to be just like Arnold Schwarzenegger's was when he was in his prime. <laughs> perfected body. A perfected heart. Jesus is the hope as a savior of the soul. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 5 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, now we live with great expectation. In other words, it's great living hope. And we have the priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Did you hear that? Beyond the reach of change and decay. Compare that with some what some ancient writers have said. And I might crucify some of these names. I apologize. I'll do my best. Achilles, he says, once a man dies, there is no resurrection. Theocrates, he says, Theocrates, thank you, I always say that wrong, Theocrates. 
There is hope only for those who are alive, but those who have died are without hope. Catulus says this, when once a brief light sets, there is one perpetual night through, much, through which we must sleep. But what does Jesus say? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Folks, there's a hope in Christmas that is beyond the hope of anything in this world or has ever been in this world. Then Jesus says in John chapter 11 as he continues on, speaking to this poor lady, do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever lives in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into this world. Listen, when Jesus was sent forth to earth from God, he was the message of of hope. Have you ever received the message from God? Maybe you feel destitute. Maybe you feel like you're on an island all by yourself. And God sends a message, but not in the form of a piece of paper in a bottle, but in the form of a baby in nature who comes to tell us, tell us about the hope in the world. I do believe we need the hope of technology. I do believe it brings us information, organization, and optimism about the future. I believe we need the hope of scientific research. If you haven't have had, ever had an ailment which they haven't had a cure for, I suspect you do too. For medicine, development, and infrastructure. I do have a hope for world peace and for leadership that will actually bring justice in nations around the world. But what good are technological advances, scientific discoveries, if the heart of mankind isn't changed and transformed? What good is it when we do these things that are of great earthly benefit if we haven't been changed at the level of the heart? For we have seen technological advances used to hurt mankind. And hold people in bondage. Persecution. We've seen all kinds of evil things that men have done with, with the knowledge that God has given them to be able to advance certain things. And we've also seen good things. If the heart of the, if the, heart of the individual is not made alive to life in Christ and the Spirit of God, what will become of the advances in our future? There can be no real hope without the heart of mankind being changed. Listen as I close this morning. A gentleman by the name of Ralph Barton, one of the top cartoonists in the United States, left this note pinned to his pillow before taking his own life. I have had few difficulties. I have had many friends. Great successes. I have gone from wife to wife, from house to house, visited great countries of the world, but I am fed up with the inventing devices to fill up 24 hours a day. That's a man with a lot of hope. What a contrast to the words of the Apostle Paul just before his impending death. For here he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is soon. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course and I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to everyone who loves and waits for his appearing. Jesus Christ, folks, 
our Christmas season. It's more than just the sentimentality of the Advent candles. And it's a beautiful tradition that we keep up. But the symbol of hope is so much greater than a simple purple candle with a light. It is the hope of the world. And through you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, in corporate worship together, become the hope of the world. Not the technological advances. Not the scientific discoveries. Not the fantasies that might one day come true. But the reality that God loves and cares so much that He would send His Son and be willing to transform our lives from death to life and then from life to abundant life. Jesus Christ is the hope for your heart, the hope for our bodies, and the hope for our soul. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, I want to thank you this morning for your people. For your people are here. They have put their faith and trust in you. The scriptures tell us that if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us. And as your people, we recognize that we still have that old nature and we have to come to you time and time again to be renewed. Maybe right now, one of your children needs a renewal. Maybe it's because there's sin there and they just need to confess that before you. In the quietness of this moment, I ask that that might happen around the room. Maybe there's a confession of lust or greed, or dishonesty, <coughs> self-indulgence, <coughs> of not being generous, whatever it might be. But we don't want to rob that we have in Christ and the work that he's doing. So we ask that you would speak to our heart and draw us close to you. And Father, I believe that there are probably some within the sound of my voice this morning who have never put their faith and trust in Christ. Maybe they had their faith in some kind of technology or that humanity would fix the problem. And maybe today they recognize that that's not ever really going to fix the problem. But that Christ already has. For he came to die, that his blood would cover our sin, and we would become right with you. When we say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my life and forgive me. And maybe this morning, right now, there's somebody within this room, or somebody in the sound of my voice, or somebody who's watching via Facebook, that might just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the whole of the world. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior and that your death paid the penalty for my sin. I believe that you've gone to glory and that you are preparing a place for us. And I look forward to one day coming to be with you so that I can be like the Apostle Paul and one day receive a crown of righteousness which Christ himself paid for me. And the hope of my life might be one that transcends this world. Father, would you by the power of your spirit do your work at this time to rise up men and women? And thank you, Lord, for being the hope of the world for us. May this Christmas season be special. May it be sweet. And may it draw us ever closer to you. In Christ's name we pray.
1 Corinthians chapter 11. Reading at verse 23 says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you continue to proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Folks, we don't take lightly the sacrifice of Christ. And so we want to remember this morning, at the beginning of our Advent season, this wonderful gift that Christ gave to us. I'm going to invite Andrew Marshall, if he would give thanks this morning for the bread, and for the juice, for Ted Newell to give thanks for the juice. If you happen to have gluten allergies, when we go to send the bread out and deliver it, and you're able to receive it, just raise your hand and ushers in the back to make sure that you get some gluten-free bread. And it's great. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you so loved us that you sent your beloved Son to die on the cross in our stead, Lord, your body broken, that we might have eternal life and forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Lord, for this. I just pray this now in your name.
once again. Who knows but that the next time may be around the throne in glory. But for today, let us not forget, but remember always the sacrifice of our Savior, His body and His blood. Eat and drink.
Wow, a lot of a lot of bad statistics uh, today, but along with them, um, a hope. And who is this hope? Jesus Christ. Thank you, Pastor Greg, for reminding us uh, who the real hope for this world is. And uh, if you want to know more about this hope, I invite you tonight to find who is Jesus um, during our series, Faith Beyond Belief. And um, Sunday, December the 10th, we're going to have our Sunday School Christmas concert in the evening, December the 17th. We're going to have the Fellowship Family Day. And man, I can't wait to be there. And as you walk or drive to your home, I would like to encourage you with these words found in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, church is dismissed. And it sounded uh, a lot better than it did when we were doing the...